All right. Um, for those of us who are from Park Church, uh, we welcome the Lutherans, and the Lutherans welcome Park Church. Here we are together, Lutherans and United Church of Christ. And the, the, the word is that the new minister speaks. And so that's Aaron's turn this year. So for those of you who are from Park Church, this is Aaron. We are, we are so glad that he is with you. We have been praying for you because we want your happiness and success as much as our own. And we are happy for what looks like a good partnership and we pray for much success together um, with the, the family. So we're ready to worship. We're, it's a more simple liturgy because it's uh, following more like how we do things. Uh, so uh, bear with us. And let's begin. Good morning. Would you please follow in the call to worship? And if you are able, please stand. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. And that is from the book of Psalms, chapter 133. Please remain standing as we read the invocation. O oh God, we remember Jesus' words. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. May they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Bless us and guide us today into the blessed future of salvation and unity. May your presence in us be light in our hearts and in our neighborhood. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Hi. All right. Oh, thank you. Hello. I invite the children to come up for the story. Welcome, everyone. Today I have a book in the box. So when we open it up, it's the book called Are You My Mother, which was a book from when I was a little boy. And so it's an old book. But it's about, um, actually, I bought this one a few years ago because I lost mine. Have you ever seen this before, Are You My Mother? Okay, you have? Have you seen it too? Okay. Well, it's about being lost and then finding again. But let me try to read it for you like this. Oh, are you my mother? Okay, there's the, look at that. Um, that's a mother. Mm -hmm. Are you my mother? Written and illustrated by P.D. Eastman. Oh, here we go. A mother sat on her egg, right? That's what they do, right? Mm -hmm. All right. The egg jumped. Oh, oh, said the mother bird. My baby will be here. He will want to eat. I must get something for my baby bird to eat, she said. I will be back. So away she went. There she goes, flying away to get something for her little baby to eat. The egg jumped. It jumped and jumped and jumped. Out came the baby bird. Mm -hmm. Where's my mother? He said. He looked for her. He looked up, and he did not see her. He looked down. 
he did not see her. I will go and look for her, he said. So away he went. Can little baby birds fly? No. no, no well, that's, you're right. Down out of the tree he went. Oh, he couldn't fly. Well, down he goes. Kaplunk. Down, down, down. It was a long way down. But little birds don't get hurt too much because they're really light. So even though he fell a long way, he didn't get hurt, which is good. Okay. The baby bird could not fly. He could not fly, but he could walk. Now I will go and find my mother, he said. He did not know that it, what his mother looked like. He went right by her, he did, and he did not see her. Look, there he is going, walking to find his mother, and there she is over there. But he, they missed each other. They didn't know they were going past each other. Look at that. Went right past her. He came to a kitten. Are you my mother? He said to the kitten. The kitten just looked and looked, and it did not say anything. The kitten, it was not mother, so he went on. Then he came to a hen. Are you my mother, he said to the hen? No, said the hen. The kitten was not his mother. The hen was not his mother. So on the little bird went. I have to find my mother, he said. Where, where, where? Where could she be? Then she came to a dog. Hmm? Are you my mother, he said to the dog. I am not your mother. I am a dog, said the dog. The kitten was not his mother, the hen was not his mother, the dog was not his mother. So the baby bird went on. Now it came to a cow. Are you my mother, he said to the cow. How could I be your mother, said the cow. I am a cow. The kitten and the hen were not his mother, the dog was not his mother. Did he have a mother? Yeah, that's, he everything has a mother. He's having a bad day, isn't he? Okay. I, I did have a mother, said the baby bird. I, I know I did. I have to find her. I will. I will. Now the baby bird walked. He didn't walk. He ran. He's starting to get anxious, right? He's starting to get scared. So he's running now. And he saw a car. Could that old thing be his mother? No, it could not. And the bird did not stop. He ran on and on. Now he looked way, way down. He saw a boat. See the boat down there, down in the river? See a boat down in the river? And he asked the, the boat, are you my mother? But the boat kept going. He looked up in the sky and saw an airplane. Are you my mother? But the plane kept flying. Then he saw this, vroom, 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 you know, dirt digger, right? Just then. What he saw was a big thing. Must be his mother. There she is, he said. There's my mother. That's not his mother, is it? No, no, no. But anyway, let's see what happens. He went right up to it. Mother, 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 he said. I, mother, I'm here. To the, he said to the thing. Yep. <laughs> But the big thing just snort. Oh, you are not my mother, said the baby bird. You are snort. I have to get out of here. He's all scared. But the baby bird could not get out. He was picked up by the big snort. By the <laughs> big, he was picked up. It went way, way above it went with the baby bird. All right, I'm getting there. All right, but now, where was the snort going? Oh, what is this snort going to do to me? Get, get me out of here. He's scared. He's up on the... What do you think happened? Oh, it's going to be good news. Oh, I already it's know. It's good news. Just then, the snort came to a stop. And guess what happens? You, you might know. Okay. Where am I, said the baby bird. I want to go home. I want my mother. And... The snort 
dropped it off in the nest where he came from. The, the something, something happened. The snort put that baby bird right back in the tree. The baby was back home again. And then look what happens. What's going to happen next? The mommy. mommy comes. Yes, with the worm too. Just then the mother bird came back to the tree. Do you know who I am? She said to her, to her baby. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? And the reason why I told this story is because today Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I, are, that I am? And he's like, do you know who I am? But anyway, here he's talking about his mother. He, she says, do you know who I am? And does he know? Does he know? Yes. Let's see what he says. Yes, I know who you are, said the baby bird. You're not a kitten. You're not a hen. You're not a dog. You're not a cow. You're not a boat. You're not a snort. And, and you're a bird. You are my mother. All right, so it's a story about getting lost and getting found, right? About things being scary, but then getting better again, right? So you've all experienced that sometimes? And today, because we're talking about Jesus, it's also about how Jesus is our Messiah, but he wants us to know who he is. And you can look all other kinds of places, but they're not your Messiah, but he's the one he says, do you know who I am? And, we, and Peter says, you're the Christ. Okay. So we have a couple of things going on. One is um, some of the children, if you wish to, and your parents want you to do it, you can go with Serena and her group to, uh, to the playground. And if you want to stay here and listen to the scriptures and the sermon, you can stay here too. All right? And, and whatever your parents say is the right thing to do. Because don't, uh, because listen to your father and mother, okay? Thank you very much. And thank you all the grown-ups for listening to this lengthy children's story. So this time we'll continue with the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, from flesh and blood, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. So first off, I just want to say how great it is to be gathered with both of our churches here today, um, and it's an honor to share this message with all of you, um, and of course to see what sorts of sweets and goodies we have gathered together after the service too. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. So I have a question for all of you. Are there any Peters out there today? Anyone a Peter out there? Or 
We know anybody know a Peter? Okay, we, we know some Peters. Out. Petra is also the female version of Peter. Any anybody know a Petra? You know a Petra? Okay, good. Well, you might be surprised to know that if your name is Peter or Petra, that you are named after this Peter right here, Peter the Rock. This is the first use of the name Peter in the Bible. In fact, this is the first use of this name anywhere in literature. Before this moment, it does not appear in Aramaic or in Greek. Now, the scribe of Matthew does use it previously when referring to Peter, such as the time that Simon Peter walked on water. But this was probably just because Matthew didn't want us to get confused as to who he was talking about. So that means that Jesus naming Simon Peter in this passage is the first time anyone in history has ever been named or called Peter. Before this, this word in Greek and Aramaic literally meant rock or stone. It was not used as a proper name. So a better translation of this passage is the part that says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, would be, and I tell you, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Sounds very caveman-like, right? You are rock. <laughs> so, but it's literally the same word. In fact, the word Peter being used as rock has even found its way into modern English. Think of the word petrified or Peter fried, which literally means to turn into stone. My point is, this moment of Jesus naming Simon Peter is something new. Simon Peter is receiving not just a new name, but a name that has never existed before. When Patty and I first started in ministry together in a small church being grant supported in Metro New York, there was a team of trustees overseeing the congregation. And before we even started, they had the conversation and then voted on deciding if the congregation should close, change its name, then reopen under a new name. Or should it just keep the same name that it's always had? Now, the reasons for this was twofold. One, it would kind of give the local community a nod that a new congregation is forming. And two, it would also open the congregation up to new grant funding for new church starts that wasn't available previously. So can you guess what the trustees voted for? Ironically, they voted to keep St. Peter's Lutheran Church named St. Peter's. They felt that the congregation would lose its identity and its heritage if it changed its name. Hmm. I wonder if the original St. Peter felt the same way when Jesus Christ renamed him. Do you think Peter pushed back and said, no, Jesus, don't change my name. I will lose sight of who I am. I won't know that I'm a Jew any longer. How will I be able to continue to do ministry? Well, if he did, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John chose not to record that part. <laughs> Instead, it seems to me that Peter humbly took this new title and proudly became the rock on which our church is founded. And that is why I think this message is for us today. Because as modern churches, I think we often get caught up in this internal dialogue of who we are. Holy Trinity, would you be willing to close your church, change your name if it benefited ministry that you're doing? Park Church, would you be willing to change your name and reopen as a new congregation if it helped propel your service of others forward? 
Or would we choose to do as so many churches do and keep our names and not be open to the new life that Jesus Christ has in store for us? Now, to be fair, St. Peter's went on to do many amazing things, such as opening a homeless shelter, a community garden, and even hosting youth groups from across the country. But I feel like we could have done even more if we are willing to let go of who we are and be willing to be moved by the Holy Spirit in ways that we don't yet know. St. Peter's would not have lost its history in doing so. Instead, it would have been embracing new life, which is what the story of Jesus is all about. It's about letting go of who we are, trusting that through Christ, we will not lose our identity, but instead be able to grow into new life. And the reason why Peter is named and ordained to be the rock on which the church is founded is not because he's the most intelligent or the best dressed of all the disciples. No, Jesus picked him because Peter proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah because God revealed that knowledge to him as a gift. Jesus says, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. You see, Peter is a living witness, a strong foundation, that new life in Jesus Christ is a free gift. And all we have to do is be brave enough to step out of the boat that we are in and walk out onto the water that Jesus calls us to. And here's the hardest thing to understand about this new life. It's not sustainable. Think about it. When Peter walks out onto the water, was his ability to walk on water sustained forever? No. In fact, he doesn't stay on the surface for very long. You see, miracles, healing, ministry, connections, none of these things are sustained forever. Rather, our work as God's people, our time as Christians in this life is impermanent. It's not sustainable. And now that might sound strange to hear coming from a long-haired, environmentally conscious pastor who likes to think that we should live sustainably when it comes to our relationship with Earth's resources. But when it comes to our relationship in the church and our ministry, our experience in the church is alive. True ministry happens with people and creatures and living organisms. And although the saying 1 Corinthians is true, we will not all die, but be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, it also says in 1 Corinthians that this perishable body must put on imperishability, meaning that our bodies and the bodies of all living creatures on earth will perish before putting on imperishability. And so if ministry is led by people, whose perishable bodies will one day be changed, that means that ministry is constantly changing. Yes, our churches will not always be here in the future. And that's okay, because the church will be. And as hard as it might be, it's time to stop grieving the ministries of the past. It's okay. Really, think of it this way. If you're building a house, you want a firm foundation, right? So you pick a firm stone to build that house upon. But what if that stone was alive? It was moving and shifting. That means your house would constantly be moving and shifting and changing, right? So you better be careful where you put grandma's china, because it might not be there tomorrow. <laughs> and even though one day this stone you built your house on dies and decays, 
That stone has been calling and ordaining others to ensure that your house stays intact. And so Christianity's foundation is unique. It's not a specific place or a special rock that a dome is built upon. Instead, the rock of the church was a living, breathing human. And so that means that our ministry, our lives together as Christians will change, so much so that we might be renamed. Yet in that change, we have a firm foundation, a living foundation. And it's interesting that the scribe of Matthew decided to share with us the location of this event. Why? Because this location has been an important location to many different religions. Earlier, Caesarea Philippi was a different name and was the center of the Baal cult. Then, in Hellenistic times, its name changed again. And this time, a temple was erected to worship the god Pan. Then, Herod the Great renamed it again and replaced that temple with a temple to worship the Caesar Augustus. Then, it changed names again. Shortly after Herod's death, when it became part of the territory of his son Philip, renaming it to Caesarea Philippi. Now, the scribe of Matthew wants to make it clear that once again, Caesarea Philippi is being renamed. It is being renamed as the place where Jesus is declared the Messiah and the location where the first living stone of a new kingdom is placed. One that is living, moving, and changing. And what sets this kingdom apart from the other kingdoms that were worshipped in Caesarea Philippi is that this kingdom, this temple, cannot be conquered. A new emperor can't come along and replace Jesus with a new God. Why? Because there's no physical stone or brick or paper that binds us. Rather, we are bound together by each other and by God's living creation. Of course, there might be some paper that we use from scripture to help guide us or the stones of this building to shelter us. But our new life in Jesus Christ comes from one another. Have you ever heard of a Buddhist mandala before? Any of you out there? Well, Tibetan monks work for hours and days and weeks and sometimes even longer to create a beautiful image of heaven out of colorful sand. These circular creations are extremely detailed and they take lots of concentration and care. Then, once the image is done, the other monks and the ones that worked on the Mandela simply walk right through it, destroying it. The lesson, nothing is permanent in life. And so it is with our ministry, a ministry that was founded on a living stone that is unconquerable and is always changing. Our ministries are beautiful in the moment. Simply look around. Look at all of us gathered here today or the children playing on the playground. We have a colorful past and an exciting future. So, our churches might change names. It might change directions. The question is, Will we be ready to be like Peter and get out of our boat and follow Jesus? Will we be willing to be renamed? Will we be ready to name Jesus our Messiah, the giver of new life? Not because we studied it, but because we lived it. I pray that both of our congregations are not sustainable. Rather, that we are bold enough to jump into the water and maybe, maybe even be renamed. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.